Now, I'm, all, I'm fairly certain that all of you here this morning, you know what this is. You all know what this is. Now, for those of you who are worshiping with us from other places around the world, this is a Canadian $10 bill, and with it, you might be able to buy a loaf of bread. Um, it's kind of getting that way, isn't it? Um, now, church, I want to ask you a question. Whose picture is this on the $10 bill? Is there anybody who can tell me who this is? Pardon? Sir John A. Macdonald. Now, who was Sir John A. Macdonald? Oh, wow. Some of you have passed your immigration test. I can hear that. That is fantastic. And I'm glad you have a sense of humor about these things. This is Sir John A. Macdonald. He was the first Prime Minister of Canada when Canada became a country. Now, Sir John A., as soon as he took over office, he had a problem. Actually, he had two problems. His first problem was this. What do you call Canada? How do you refer to it? Do you call it the United Nations of Canada, the United Provinces of Canada? Do you call it the Kingdom of Canada? And the second problem he had was this. How do you unite a country as big as Canada? Land mass wise, we are the second largest country in the world. So how do you name it and how do you unite it? Well, to solve the first problem, along came a man by the name of Sir Samuel Leonard Tilly, and he was the premier of New Brunswick. And this is a man who loved Jesus. He was a God-fearing man. He was a Christian. And as the legend has it, as the story has it, one morning he was sitting in his study, and he was having his morning devotional, and he was led to this passage in Scripture. And it's from Psalms chapter 72 and verse 8, and it says, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, Tilly read this, and he said, wow, isn't this a perfect description of Canada? Here we have the St. Lawrence River in the south. Canada goes all the way to the north, literally to the ends of the earth, because there's nothing above us, and it goes from sea to shining sea from the uh, Atlantic, where I come from, all the way over to the Pacific in B.C. And he said, wow, this is an amazing description of our country, Canada. Wouldn't it be great if Canada became a dominion under God? Well, as history tells us, on September 1st, 1867, in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, 33 fathers of confederation came together and they were beginning to draft what is now known as the British North American Act. It basically would become a piece of legislature that would help design the framework for this country, Canada. And an argument broke out. And the argument was this, what do we call this thing called Canada? Now, Sir John A. was a brilliant man. He was a passionate man. He wanted a strong and united Canada. So he said, well, why don't we call it the Kingdom of Canada? Kingdom sounds like a really strong word. What a great word for a country. Well, on that morning, Sir Samuel Leonard Tilly stood up, and he broke out the Word of God, and he shared with them Psalms um, 72, verse, the Psalms Yes, 72, verse 8, and which he read, And he shall have dominion from the south to the ends of the earth, from sea to shining sea. And he shared with them his vision for a country over which God would have dominion. And on that day, they adopted as their motto, He shall have dominion from sea to sea. And Canada was now named the Dominion of Canada. Later on in 1929... We developed a coat of arms, and that coat of arms adopted part of that motto. And now, I don't read Latin, so if you speak Latin, please um, correct me. Feel free to do so. But our motto reads in Latin, a mare iusc ad mare, which means from sea to sea. And on July the 1st, 1867, the Dominion of Canada was born. Now, let me ask you, what do we celebrate every July the 1st? Canada Day. But do you know that up until 1980, it had a different name? How many of you remember celebrating Dominion Day? Anybody old enough to remember Dominion Day? Some of you are shaking your heads. From 1867 to 1979, this country celebrated on July the 1st, Dominion Day. It wasn't until 1980 that we changed it from Dominion Day to Canada Day. 
But for over a hundred years, we recognized that we were a nation truly under God. And so <clears throat> Sir John A's <clears throat> excuse me, first problem was solved. We now had a name for Canada. But the second problem was, how do you unite this country? And as the Fathers of Confederation came together, they suggested, how about we build a transcontinental railway that would run from one coast to the other? And they thought it was a great idea, but again, they ran into two problems. And the first problem was this, how do you finance it? Well, along came the Canadian Pacific Railway, and they said we would finance it because, well, this railway would cover some 25 million acres of land, and it would cost some $25 million to build. Today, this project would cost almost a billion dollars in today's um, economy to, to complete a railway like this. And so the Canadian Pacific Railway signed a deal with the Canadian government. The government didn't have $25 million back then, and back then they absolutely refused to go into debt. Wouldn't you like to have a government that refuses to go into debt? So anyway, I'll get out of politics and I'll go back to history. So the Canadian Railway, Pacific Railway, set about to build a railway from here to Vancouver, British Columbia. But now let me ask you, is there something that might stand in the way between us and Vancouver, British Columbia? Is there something that might cause a barrier between us and the other side? Can you think of something? They are called the Canadian Rockies, and more specifically, the Selkirk Mountains in southern Alberta. And so they said, we, 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 there must be a way to get through these mountains. And so in order to find a way, they turned to a man. His name was Major Albert Bowman Rogers. He was a major from the United States Army. He was a famous surveyor. And they said, if anybody can find a way through the Canadian Rockies, it'll be this man. And so they offered him $5,000 uh, to go and find this pass. And he said, sure, I'll do it. I'll do it for the 5000 but I have one other condition. If I find a way through the mountains, you need to name that pass after me. And the, the Canadian Pacific Railway said, sure, why not? We'll do that. And sure enough, on May the 29th, 1881, Major Albert Bowman Rogers sent a telegraph back to the CPR saying, I found a way through the mountains. And today, if you travel from Calgary, Alberta, to Vancouver, British Columbia, you will go through what is now known as Rogers Pass. And so they began the work constructing the, the transcontinental railway, and their desire was to build a, 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 a railway that would unite this country. Now, some of you might be asking, okay, Pastor Bob, great history lesson, but what does this actually have to do with the mountain-moving faith? This, this is where I'm going with this. As Christians, we recognize that mountains are always going to be a part of our journey. Are they not? Whether, they, whether it's there by God or whether it's there by not, mountains are always going to be a part of your life. And the thing about mountains is, is, is that they can be a good thing. Think about this. What would Canada be like without the Canadian Rockies? Anybody here ever been to the Canadian Rockies? Have you ever had the opportunity to go west? If you have not... Put it on your bucket list, go west, go to the mountains. They are beautiful, they are majestic, they are splendid, they are spectacular. And by the way, the Transcontinental Railway to this day still runs through the Canadian Rockies. Um, I, I kind of overshot this, uh, but in November 3rd in 1885, uh, the last spike was actually driven here uh, in Jackfish, Ontario. And it connected us to these, the Canadian Rockies. The Rockies are spectacular. They're amazing. They're beautiful. You can still take a train ride through the mountains to today. And I'm told it is magnificent. That is on my bucket list. Folks, we as Christians recognize that mountains are a part of our journey. We as Christians, we talk about mountaintop experiences, do we not? And what do we mean by that? It means we're having a spiritual high. It means we're blessed. It means we are feeling close to the Lord. And then we talk about the valleys as being a low point in our life. But now let me ask you, have you ever actually climbed a mountain? Anybody here actually ever hike or climb up a mountain? Let me ask you something. Is that easy? Absolutely not. So why would we do it? We do it for the view. 
We do it for the experience. We do it for the blessing that takes place once we get there. My family loved climbing in the Rocky Mountains. Now, many of you have met my son, Justin. This is Justin. He's nine years of age, and we are in a place called Hoodoo Creek. We're about to climb up a mountain. And in this picture, Justin is smiling. If you had met Justin three years prior to this, I guarantee you he would not be smiling. As a matter of fact, we went for a hike one weekend, took our family, took some friends, we drove out to the Rockies, and we just simply picked a mountain. We would look for a mountain and say, okay, we think we could hike that, and then we would take on the mountain. Well, on this particular weekend, the climb was hard. I mean, it was a tough hike, and we were used to hiking. And I didn't realize how tough this hike was until Justin, we got to the top, Justin turned around with tears in his eyes, put his hands on his hips, and he said, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> in this picture, he's smiling. Do you know why? Because mountains had become such a regular part of his life, he knew how to take them on and overcome them. And today, Justin is 23, almost 23 years of age, and if you go hiking with Justin in the mountains, he will leave you in the dirt. Do you know why? Because mountains have always been a part of his life, and he has been acclimatized to the mountain experience. He knows how to get to the top because he knows about the journey. You do the journey because of the blessing at the top. Christian, there are going to be times in your life when God will put a mountain in your path because he wants to teach you the journey, the struggle, the victory of what it takes to overcome a mountain. And sometimes what God wants you to do is not avoid the mountain or remove the mountain, but to overcome it and to not go around it, but to go over it. There are times in your life God wants to grow your faith by going over it, not around it. And so many of us today avoid the mountains, we avoid the struggle, we avoid the challenge of what it means to grow in Jesus because we don't like the effort and the strain of growing in Jesus. But sometimes in order to grow, you have to strain, you have to climb, you have to go where God leads you, and sometimes where he leads you is over the mountain. But then there are going to be times in life when you're going to encounter a mountain and it is not of God. You see, at this church, we have a mission. Our mission is to empower both saints and seekers to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And that is our mission. And when we live that mission, there is actually no mountain that can stand in our way. But there are times when the enemy will put a mountain in your path because he wants to stop you from achieving God's plan and mission for your life and our church. And there are times when that mountain is so big and so powerful that we actually do not have the ability to overcome it in, on our own. So what do you do when you encounter such a mountain? What do you do when you encounter a mountain that you cannot overcome? And by the way, I want to ask the question this morning, what is your mountain? What is it that the enemy has thrown in your path that you are struggling with that on your own you cannot overcome it? As a matter of fact, on your own, if God does not remove it, it threatens to destroy you, hurt you, or do damage in your life. What is your mountain? Because I want to share with you today, we serve a mountain-moving God, and there is no mountain bigger than our God. Amen. So if you're a person here today who has a mountain and you need God to remove it, here are three things I'm going to ask you to do. There are other things you can do, but I'm going to ask you to do these three things that will connect you with a mountain-moving God. And here they are. One, put your faith in Jesus. Two, keep your eyes on Jesus. And three, I want you to follow Jesus. Now, I want to talk about that first one for a few moments. Put your faith in Jesus. Now, here's where I get this from. It's Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, and it reads, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So the question I want to ask this morning is this, what does it mean to keep your faith in Jesus? Have you ever noticed we say a lot of things in church, but we don't actually talk about how do you practically do it? How do you actually keep your faith in Jesus? I want to put it to you this way. 
when somebody makes you a promise, do you trust the promise or do you trust the one making the promise? Do you trust the promise or the one making the promise? When somebody makes you a promise, what you're trusting is not their words, but what you are trusting is what you know to be true about that person. So when somebody makes you a promise and you are going to act on it, what you do is you say to yourself, what do I know about this person? Are they faithful to their word? Can I trust them? And do they have a history of doing what they promised to do? You do not trust the promise, you trust the one making the promise. So when you put your faith in Jesus, you're not actually putting your faith in the promise, you're putting your faith in what you know to be true about Jesus. So let me ask you, what do you know to be true about Jesus? Because that's what you're putting your faith in. Is Jesus somebody you can trust? Is Jesus somebody who keeps his word? Is Jesus somebody who would deceive you or trick you? What is it you know to be true about Jesus? Because this is what you're going to put your faith in. Here's what I know about Jesus, and here's what I know about God. He loves you. And when I put my faith in Jesus, I'm putting my faith in the fact that he loves me. Because I trust people who love me. I trust them because I know they have my best interests at heart. So when Jesus makes a decision on your behalf, anything he does for you, asks of you. It is done because he loves you. He always does things because he loves you. And so when you put your faith in Jesus, you are putting your faith in what you know to be true about him. Do you believe that Jesus is a mountain moving God? Do you believe this? I believe that Jesus wants to move the mountains in your life. As a matter of fact, when you touch him in faith, when you trust his love, his grace can't help but respond to your faith. It is actually in the heart of God, it is the natural tendency of God's heart to respond to your faith with his grace. Now, let me share with you why I believe that is. In our scripture reading today, we read a story. And in this story, Jesus had actually come down from a mountain. Does anybody recognize this mountain? Can you guess what mountain this might be in the Bible? This is the Mount of Transfiguration. That morning, Jesus had taken Peter, James, and uh, John, and he had gone to the top of this mountain, and there he met two people. Who were they? Moses and Elijah. And And after he had met with Moses and Elijah, he came back down from that mountain And at the base of the mountain, there was a man there. He was a father. He had a problem. He had a mountain. And it just threatened to destroy somebody he loved. It was his son. His son was demon-possessed, had fits, epileptic seizures, would throw himself into a fire. And his dad was desperate. His dad had actually gone to the disciples and asked for help, but the disciples couldn't even move this mountain. So the man comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I'm sorry. I I hate to bother you. Actually, Jesus, I went to your disciples and they couldn't help me. And and, and I'm coming to you because, Jesus, I know you can move the mountains. He didn't say that, but that's what he means. He says, Jesus, if you don't help us, who will? There are times in life when I've been on my knees and I said, God, if you don't help me, who will? Because there's no other mountain moving God but God. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and he's angry. And he's angry. And and, and often we look at what he says and he says, oh, ye of little faith. And we think that the reason Jesus is angry is because they didn't have enough faith to make something happen. I think Jesus is angry because when his disciples couldn't cast out this demon, they failed to do the one thing they should have done. They should have gone to Jesus and they didn't. They left a man in spiritual bondage when they could have gone to Jesus. I wonder how many of us are struggling with mountains and bondage because we refuse to go to Jesus. It wasn't that they lacked faith that could could make this happen. It was that they lacked the faith to go to Jesus. And Jesus set the young man free. Because whomever Jesus sets free, they're free. Well, later the disciples did come to Jesus. 
And they did ask the question, Jesus, why, why is it that we couldn't, we couldn't in your name cast this demon out? And Jesus looked at him and said, if you had faith, faith in me, not in yourself, not, not in words, not in promises, but if you had faith in me the size of a mustard seed, you would be able to say to this mountain, let me ask you something, where's Jesus standing right now? He's standing at the base of that mountain. When he says you can say to this mountain, he's saying you can say to this mountain, if your faith is in me, be moved from here to there and it will move because your faith is in me. You have a mountain and it needs to be moved. Is your faith in Jesus? Is your faith undeniably, unshakably in this fact that Jesus Christ loves you and if there's something threatening you, hurting you, harming you, or blocking God's will for your life, Jesus will move it. But is your faith rooted in God's love for you? So much so that you know, you know that when God says he will do it, he will do it. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you, not because of your strength, but because of your faith in Jesus. There was a woman, and you may have recognized her from my earlier slide. She had a mountain. She had a problem. And her mountain was going to kill her. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. Can you imagine having a hemorrhage for 12 years? She'd been bleeding out for 12 years. And she'd heard about Jesus. She hadn't met him. She had never talked to him. She had never seen him in action, but she had heard about Jesus. She heard that Jesus was the kind of man who when he went from town to town, he left nobody in bondage. He left nobody sick. He healed everybody, and she believed that if she could just touch him, he would heal her based on what she knew to be true about a man she'd never met. Think about that. She had never met him, but she believed in him. And she believed that he could heal. So Jesus comes to town. You know the story. He comes to her town, to her village. And, and, and Jesus is surrounded by people. He's surrounded by his disciples, his posse. He's surrounded by his fan club. He's surrounded by hundreds of people that day. And everybody wants to touch Jesus. And they did, including this woman. And Jesus, the moment she touches him, you know the story, she is healed. And Jesus stops everybody and he says, whoa, hang on here, somebody just touched me. And Peter looks at him and says, ah, uh, is, is, is this a test? Uh, are you kidding, Lord? You're surrounded by hundreds of people who are trying to touch you and you're asking who touched you? And Jesus goes, no, 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 you do not understand Somebody touched me in such a way that power went out from me. Think about this story. Jesus didn't go, okay, lady, you touched me. Now I'm going to heal you. She touched him and something went out from him because it is the natural tendency of God's heart to respond to our touches of faith. She did not request, he did not offer, she reached out in faith and God automatically responded. Do you know what touches God? Your love, your relationship with him. You cannot come to your heavenly father, reach out for him in love, touch him in love, trust him in love, and his grace not respond to you. It is impossible for God to not respond to love, for God is love. Do you see how this works? If you have a mountain in your life and it needs to be removed, put your faith in Jesus and your faith in his love for you. Reach out to him in love and his grace cannot help but respond to your faith. Amen. And so if you have a mountain in your life, can I suggest, put your faith in God's love for you. Put your faith in God's ability to move mountains. 
and the mountain will move. The next thing I want you to do is keep your eyes on Jesus. We read in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now again, practically speaking, how do you do this? And I'd like to suggest the way you keep your eyes on Jesus is you got to talk to Jesus. You have got to talk to Jesus because this is about staying in communication and contact with him. It's not enough to just put your faith in Jesus. you got to have a relationship with Jesus and stay in contact with him because he wants to hear your prayers. But I cannot tell you how often somebody will have a mountain and they'll say, well, maybe we should pray. Uh, maybe we should talk to God about it. Or you've got something going on in your life and you really need an answer and you get to maybe one or two prayers and you say, well, I prayed to God and you just leave it there. I want to tell you about a man named Daniel. He was a prophet. And one day God gave him a vision. And Daniel didn't understand the vision. And so he prayed for revelation. You had John the Revelator, well, you got Daniel the Revelator too. He wanted revelation. And he got down on his knees and he prayed. No answer. So the next day he got on his knees and he prayed. No answer. Next day, no answer. Next day. This went on for three weeks. For three weeks he was on his knees praying to God, asking God for a revelation, for God to literally move the mountain that kept him from seeing and understanding God's vision. You know God's got a vision for this church? He's got a vision for your life? Have you, ever, have you ever gone to your knees and stayed on your knees until the mountain was removed so you could see God's vision for your life, for our church? Daniel got on his knees. Three weeks later, an angel shows up and he says, Daniel, I'm finally here. You need to know from the moment you prayed, I was ordered to come and reveal the vision to you, but I got stopped. Satan got in my way, and for three weeks, Daniel, while you prayed, we fought. You prayed, we fought. You prayed, and we fought. Until eventually, Jesus himself stepped in, and he was the victory. Amen. Can you imagine maybe what might have happened if Daniel stopped praying four days later? What if he'd stopped praying two weeks later? Well, what if he had made it to like two and a half weeks and he'd stopped praying? I don't know, maybe he would not have received the revelation. But he prayed, and there was a war going on behind the scenes. But notice what the angel had said. From the moment you prayed, God sent me to answer your prayer, but the enemy gets in the way. You have been praying for God to remove mountains in your life, and maybe the reason the mountain has not yet been moved is because the enemy is standing in the way, and we're not keeping our eyes on Jesus. Talk to Jesus, and you keep talking to him, and you keep talking to him until that mountain is removed. Amen. Drew and Clarissa were a young Christian couple. They loved Jesus. They got married. They loved each other. They wanted to have a baby. And eventually, they tried, and they conceived. They got two months into the pregnancy, and... Clarissa felt like something was wrong. She just, she just, she said, she said, Drew, something's wrong with the baby. I can feel it. I don't feel good. I don't feel right. Something is wrong. We need to go to our doctor. So they rushed to their doctor, their family doctor, and they ran some tests. And the doctor came back and he said, I got some bad news. The baby's not moving, and your hormone levels are way, way down. And I'm concerned. The baby might have died. You might have lost the baby. The doctor also happened to be a member of the church. And he said, you know what? I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that we matter to Jesus. He said, would you deal with me in my office? I want to pray for you. And I want to ask God. I want to ask God to bring his healing into your situation. So they got down on their knees. And they prayed right there in his office. And when they got back up to their feet, he said, you know what? I want you to come back every day this week. I want you to come back for the next seven days, and I want to monitor your progress. And he said, every time we're going to pray. Amen. So each day they would come, pray, run a test. First day, baby did not move, but the hormone levels came up just a little bit. Second day they prayed, 
hormone levels came up a little bit more. But the baby hadn't moved. Third day, hormone levels come up. Baby doesn't move. Fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, hormones are coming up, but that baby has not moved. On the seventh day, and I don't know what it is about that number seven, but on the seventh day, they got on their knees and they prayed, and the hormone levels went up and that baby moved. Seven months later, Justin Cole was born to his parents because they had kept their eyes on Jesus. He was a prayed-for child, and believe me, they didn't just stop praying at the end of those seven days. They prayed throughout that pregnancy, and they prayed throughout that young man's life because he was a gift from God. They had a mountain. The baby couldn't move, but God moved a baby because God can move anything. So if you have a mountain you want God to move, keep your eyes on Jesus, keep praying, keep talking, keep that connection going, and trust in his love for you. And then the last thing I want to suggest you do is follow Jesus. In Luke 9 and 23, it reads, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Folks, if you want God to move your mountain, sometimes you got to follow where God is leading. And sometimes that's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes it's going to be scary. And quite often when we are uncomfortable and we are afraid, we tend to avoid it rather than go through it. But when God leads you, when God leads you, there is nothing to fear. There is nothing to be worried about. Did you recognize the lady who was in the picture I just showed? Do you recognize this woman? Her name is Mother Teresa. And what is she famous for? What is she best known for? Her work with the lepers in Calcutta, India. Her mission work, her love and care of her fellow human being. That's what she's best known for. But what most people don't know about Mother Teresa is that for 17 years, She lived in Calcutta, India, and she did nothing to help a single person. She did nothing for 17 years to help a single soul because she felt uncomfortable, because she was scared, because they were different. She didn't know the language. They they, they talked differently, and they smelled funny, and, and they were poor, and they were dirty, and she just didn't feel comfortable around these people. But God had a plan for her life. One night she was walking home, and it was in the dark. And she was walking, and and all of a sudden, just out of the dark, out of nowhere, she heard this cry. It was a sob. It was a moan. It was the deepest pain she had ever heard in the cry of another human being. And whatever it was, that cry was so pitiful and so filled with sorrow that it finally moved on her heart. And she decided to actually move out of her comfort zone, move past her fear, and she walked across the street. And she saw lying in there in the ditch, there was a woman about her height. She was sick. She had sores. There were maggots in the sores. Uh, her bones were protruding through her skin. And when Mother Teresa looked at her, her heart was filled with such pity that she actually picked the woman up. And Mother Teresa was not a big woman, but she could pick this woman up. She was so light, and she carried her to her home. She bathed her, cleaned the maggots out of the wounds, bandaged and dressed the wounds, bathed the woman, combed her hair, fed her a little bit of her own soup. She put the woman in her bed, And then she laid her head in her lap. She stroked her hair. And that lady looked up at her. And she said, thank you. And with those words, she died. And with tears in her eyes, Mother Teresa fell to her knees in repentance and begged God to forgive her of her sin of neglecting those around her. And she swore that day on her knees before God that another human being, that another human being would ever die around her alone again if she could possibly help it. 
That night, she walked across the road into God's plan for her life, and she moved out of her comfort zone. She moved out of her fear. She embraced a woman who needed her, who needed Jesus, and she literally fell into a ministry that would define her for the rest of her life. Her mountain was her fear, and God removed it that night, and she became famous for her love. Are we famous? Are we famous for our love? I'm told that on the day of judgment, Jesus is going to separate people into two groups, and he's going to ask, who did you feed? Who did you clothe? Who did you visit? Who did you give a glass of water? Mother Teresa has hundreds of people behind her. She fed, clothed, watered, visited. She loved. Who have you loved? Is it because maybe we've been a little too afraid? and We've been stuck in our ivory towers. Maybe we've been afraid we're going to get dirty. We're going to get some sin on us. Maybe we're afraid of being taken advantage of. We were told to go into the world, a dirty world, a world where people are different than us, a world where people are not like us, and we were told to go and make disciples. And sometimes the biggest thing standing in our way is ourselves. God has a mission for this church to go and empower people to become fully devoted disciples and followers of Jesus. Are you willing to put your faith in him? Are we willing to pray and keep our eyes on Jesus? And are you willing to follow Jesus no matter where it takes us because we know that our God is a mountain-moving God? What is your mountain? What is it you came here today when you came up front and you got on your knees and you prayed? What is your mountain? What is it you're asking God to do in your life? What mountain do you want removed? What prayer do you need answered? What revelation do you need? What vision are you asking for? If that's you today, if you have a mountain and you need a mountain moving God, then can I suggest you put your faith in Jesus, you keep your eyes on Jesus, and you follow him no matter where it leads. And if you trust in his love for you, with just this, this amount of trust, you'll be able to say to that mountain be moved. And it will be moved because you have a mountain-moving God. Amen.